HR issues can kill you. One complaint against your company can turn your world upside down. And you spend way too much time dealing with HR when you should be spending your time on making a profit. You should talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated U.S.-based HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They get to know you and your business while providing HR expertise and the personal touch you need and want. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost 80 grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Accelerate under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Spelled BAM, B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Accelerate. Some cars are comfy on the inside, but don't have power on the outside. And some cars have the horsepower, but none of the comfort. I used to think there weren't any cars that were the total package, but that all changed when I got my Honda SUV. It's rugged and sophisticated, and right now, Honda has deals on the entire Honda SUV lineup. CRV, HRV, Pilot, Passport, you name it. So if you're looking for a car that's the total package, the only place you'll find it is at your local Honda dealer. Hurry before they're all gone. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth with your host, Diane Helbig. Diane is a leading small business development and leadership coach, author, and speaker who is passionate about sharing valuable ideas, tips, and techniques with business professionals worldwide. Diane brings you the world's experts and gurus in all things business, whether it's sales, structure, social media, planning, or plateauing, guests bring their expertise and energy to each episode. When growing your business is your focus, Accelerate Your Business Growth is the show to listen to. Got a topic or guest suggestion? Let Diane know. The goal is to make sure you have the information you need to move your business forward. Thanks for joining us. Settle in and enjoy. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. Today's podcast is sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken audio entertainment and information. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. Get a free book when you sign up for a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth. Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast continues to gain recognition as a great resource for uh, small business owners, sales professionals, uh, entrepreneurs and the like, uh, and this is really because of the guests who join me. Uh, they share their expertise in particular areas of business uh, with all of you so that you can get what you need, implement uh, some of these ideas in your business, and do better things. Today is no different. Today my guest is Justin Goodbread. Justin is the owner of Heritage Investors and FinanciallySimple.com. He's a nationally recognized financial planner, financial educator, wealth manager, author, speaker, and entrepreneur. Armed with over 20 years of experience starting, buying, growing, and selling businesses, Justin spends most of his time helping fellow business owners across the country increase and manage the value of their businesses and personal assets so they can live the life of their dreams now and in the future. Thanks so much for joining me today, Justin. Thanks for having me, Diane. Absolutely. Uh, we are um, going to be spending some time today talking about why business value is more important than business profitability. And I, I, this is an interesting subject for me. I, I don't think it's one I've ever... Um, had a conversation about, so it's good. I'm going to get educated along with uh, the listeners. Um, 
let's talk about a, a business owner who is thinking about preparing their business for sale at some point. What do they need to know about what makes a business attractive to buyers? Okay. So let's back it up so I can lay the stage. All right. Okay. I've, my job is to not get too deep in the weeds, Diane. So I try to keep things super simple so my 13 year old can understand it. And if you right want to dive a little deeper, then just say, hey, Justin, let's go a little deeper on that subject. Okay. Um, the first thing we have to understand is what is the value of our business. And so that's done typically with an appraisal or a benchmark. And I would even take it a step back and say that if someone's looking to try to sell their business, there's a thing called a value gap that we often deal with in the business world and in our planning world. And that's where we business owners think our businesses are worth a lot more money than they are. In fact, there's some statistics that show that for us business owners, about 80% of our net worth is our business. So if you look at the financial sheet or the asset liability statement we give to a bank, many times our business sits at the top of our net worth status. That's scary to me as a planner, and it should be for us business owners because statistically, middle market, and that's those that have about $5 million to $100 million in annual sales, statistically, the middle market, which we can track pretty well, only about 3%, 3% of businesses actually sell for what the business owner thinks they're worth. Wow. So we have to understand that we're facing, if, if we want to sell our business, we're already facing an uphill climb. Then it gets even scarier that only about 7.5% of businesses actually sell. That's crazy to me. The reason for that is that we business owners often get so busy. You've heard the old saying, working in our business versus working on our business. But more yeah. importantly, we don't realize what makes a business valuable. We think that if we have a good amount of income, that it's a valuable business. And obviously somebody else will want to jump into that business. And many times that could be the case, but oftentimes it's not, it's not the case. So we have to look at what drives the business value. And there's three basic things that's going to drive a business value. And that is cash flow, how much money we make and where we spend it. The tangible assets, um, you know, for a service industry like mine, it may be computers, it may be money in the bank, it may be patents for trademarks, for uh, it may be a, an equipment list. I have, um, you know, many people who have like construction areas that they have tons and tons, millions of dollars worth of equipment, machining tools, you know, those are the things we can actually see and touch. And then we get into intangible assets. And I got to tell you, Diane, if we business owners could ever grasp the value of intangible assets, we can quickly understand how to drive our business up and how to create it to where it's desirable. So does that make sense? The cash flow, tangible and intangible asset so far? It does. Okay. Yes. Let's deal with intangible assets because that's the, yeah. that's the golden goose, right? Yeah, right. Okay. Intangible assets can be broken down to four basic categories. Um, human capital. So that are the play, that's the players on your team, okay? Um, one of the biggest mistakes that we business owners make is often we become the new know-all, do-all of our businesses. The business, yeah. we're, we're at the epicenter of our business, right? Everything revolves yeah. around us and no decisions made without us being involved. If that's a hard business to sell. It's a hard business to transfer because if you are the end-all, do-all, then how do I replace you? Right. Um, it's not uncommon for me to see business owners who they're the, they're the best salesperson in their business. That is scary for somebody trying to buy a business because if you, the best salesperson leaves, then how yeah. am I going to maintain the relationship? Right. Right. Yeah. So human capital, the team is one of the biggest intangible assets. Actually in my book, in my book, the ultimate sale, I wrote about the dream team, the basketball team back when I was a kid in the eighties and how they just dominated the world stage. And it's because that they had the best of the best players on that team. And that's what we want to build in our business. We want to have a team that can operate without us being involved. 
Okay, so that's the first intangible asset that, I, that we try to teach folks to look at. The second is called customer capital. Um, it's not uncommon for us to analyze a business and see there's customer concentration issues where maybe one customer provides 50, 60, 70, 80, heaven forbid, 90% of the revenue to the company. If we can dilute that customer concentration down to where one customer produces less than 1% of the revenue of the company, then we've won. We create diversity. We create an expanded customer base. So that's the second intangible asset that we deal with. Okay. The third one is perhaps the hardest. It's called the structural capital. The way I like to say it is systems. I use an illustration. If anybody reads any of my stuff on Financially Simple, they'll see me often talk about the McDonald's brothers versus Ray Kroc. The McDonald's brothers knew how to cook a heck of a hamburger. I bet that, you know, any of us could cook better hamburgers than McDonald's. But Ray Kroc systematized the hamburger business to where now 16-year-olds in our society, 18, 19-year-olds, those getting started in life can go into McDonald's and cook French fries and not burn the building down, Right. So they've, they've systematized the delivery of a simple piece of meat and some bread. Well, arguably a piece of meat and some bread. <laughs> no offense, a McDonald's. Of faith. Yeah. <laughs> no, no offense, McDonald's. You did a great job on your systems. But that's one of those intangible assets that is easy to talk about, hard to pull off. Because we want to create a business that has a system from the time the customer comes on our radar, we call it throughput, from the time they come on our radar to the time that they are satisfied or repeating customer. We want to create a system for every position on it so that you don't have to run the business, you or anybody else, from a memory, from a white pad, from anything else. We want to have uh, systems in place. That's the third intangible asset. And the fourth is what's called social capital. Um, we all remember, if I say this, the BP oil to oil crisis they had whenever we had tankers go awry. I can remember as a kid, Exxon. I can remember the, the Gulf spill with BP. And any time that yeah. the community or our environment around us is affected negatively by our business, by our reputation, et cetera, it can create a negative value for our company. So we have to create goodwill in our social environment with those potential customers, potential vendors, potential everybody involved, employees, et cetera, so that the name of the business is above reproach and that it's standing paramount in your local or in your marketplace. And those four areas are the intangible portion of a business value. Does that make sense so far? It does, yes. Let me pause there and see if I went too fast or if I covered any que if I hit your question. I think I got a lot of it there, but yeah, I, I, actually, I think you did too. And I and I really appreciate you explaining the intangible because uh, you know by virtue of the fact that it's intangible, I think it um, it is really. I, I don't think anyone's necessarily thinking about it. I would like you, if you would, um, talk a little bit more about the structural. Because I agree with you, I, I think it's easy to say, I think it's hard to do. And so, so maybe if you can talk about it in terms of, it, once again, if someone's listening and they're thinking, okay, I need to set my business up for, so that I can sell it at some point, and I'm listening and I'm hearing that I need to have structural capital, which means I need to have systems, what, what are the steps they take? Like, what do they do sure. to start that process? Sure. So whenever a client engages one of my three companies for any type of service, if it's value growth, which is where we do an appraisal of the business today, and when we say, hey, we want to we want to double the value of the business. In fact, I would dare say, and I've yet to been proven wrong on this, that most companies can double their enterprise value in about three to five years. Most companies can. Now, what I just said is easy to say, but until you isolate or, or dissect a business into these eight quadrants, I'm going to go over it then becomes chewable, like the elephant analogy. How do you eat an elephant, right? Um, yeah. So let's, let's dissect the business. There's eight key areas of every business out there. Many would argue there's five. Some would say there's four. I view it as eight. The first two is called planning and leadership. Planning is often at the executive level. It's where we're headed to in five, six, seven, ten 10 years, maybe three years. Leadership is how your management team or you, the, the, you, the business owner, is going to 
focus and align your team into the area that you want them to head. So those are two areas, planning and leadership. The second two are often combined together. I view them as separate. They're called sales and marketing. Some people say they're the same thing. I don't, I disagree with that. I think there's two different positions as we're going to get to the, the structural, the systems and explain why. Sales is, sales is actually getting someone to sign on the dotted line, whatever that sale looks like. Marketing is getting them to the door, building back pressure up, okay, yeah. into, your, into, your, into your business. The, the, the five and six components of a business is people and operations. People is how do you hire people, how do you fire people, how do you promote people, how do you retain people, et cetera. Operations is everything that controls throughput, whatever your goods or service is for your particular customer, how can you control that and make it extremely efficient? We've, we've read books on the Japanese style modeling. We've read books on lean processing, things of that nature. That's throughput. That's the operational side of your business. And then the last two is finance and risk management or legal. Finance being what a CFO, a compliance officer would be, a tax compliance officer may be. And finance and legal, I'm sorry, legal or risk management would be all your legal documents, your insurances and things of that nature. So if you decide, if you dissect your company into those eight key areas, now the systems portion of the company or pulling off this becomes more attainable. Yeah. <clears throat> sorry. Okay. The way I like to describe it, Diane, is you lay a funnel, like I would pour liquids from one large container to a small container or an hourglass, like sand dropping between an hourglass. Let's put it on its side. And so at the entrance of the funnel is where sales starts. We've been out here marketing and we're just trying to get people's eyeballs to our business. If we're going to systematize that, it's as simple as creating a marketing plan running your top two or three or four KPIs, key performance indicators for your marketing plan to know what your cost of acquisition is going to be. How do you reduce your cost of acquisition per customer? And creating a system that's going to track each of the activities you do in the marketing and then convert that intel into actionable data that you can now become more efficient in your marketing structure. Does that make sense? completely. <clears throat> then we go into the sales process. We're still working through that sideways hourglass or that funnel. Now we have eyeballs in our door and now they maybe are, are a lead, a prospect, depending on the terminology of your business, a uh, whatever. You're trying to now get them through that funnel, which is where they say, yes, I want to engage in now currency exchanges, uh, product for service, whatever. The sales process is just like the marketing process. Are you going to take your business? Or are you going to divide it into subsets where you have sales areas or sales divisions or territories amongst maybe a geographic area, maybe a demographic area? Are you going to create a standardized uh, sales process deliverable? Are you going to do use for RFPs, request for productions or proposals, request for proposal? Are you going to create a standardized process that where your top salesperson who now just left you a new one can come in and follow the exact same process and deliver the exact same communication. And that's how you're going to systematize sales. And I'm giving the high levels, obviously we can dive down each yeah, of these levels. Right. Okay. Yeah. So now yeah. they've said, yes. Now the customer said, yes, Hey, I want to buy what you're selling. You're good at your service, right? Now it's a matter for your operations to come in, in, in place and say, okay, the time has said, yes, how, fast or how efficient, how profitable can we move that transaction through? So I realize that some of the listeners are going to have service-based industries like mine. They may have manufacturing-based businesses or some type of a widget-based business. Obviously, you're trying to track the KPIs, the key performance indicators again, for your particular style business that's going to identify the length of time and the profitability of that throughput and that's that little funnel area as they're going through that funnel on that on that hourglass or that or that funnel that's laid sideways how fast can we handle that or how efficient right and there again you're tracking every step and you're making it to where you're you the business owner as you know in your head each one of those steps now you're making it to where if you want to go on a cruise somewhere you want to go sit at the beach like i really want to do right now go sit at the beach and read a book 
then you realize that there's somebody who can look at every step of the process and give you real time data as to where your customers are within that process. So now we've dealt with the operations. The other area, the other areas as far as people, what's your process for hiring people? What's your process for firing people? Put it in writing. How do you promote people? How do you give them equity if that's the case? All that goes into a writing manual that you can identify and actually one day move that from your position, the owner, to maybe a director of HR who now can run that particular process. You didn't do, you didn't repeat it through the planning, through the leadership, through every other area. That's how you systematize your business. I, I, I love this because it is so um, clear and specific. And I think a lot of times there are owners who feel really comfortable in one of those key areas. And so th there's the possibility that structurally that they're really sound in that area, but because they aren't necessarily comfortable in the other seven, they don't necessarily, you know, it, it, they, they don't have it figured out and they're not even necessarily thinking about it. Well, what you're identifying is the personality makeup of the business owner. In fact, on the blog that we write, Financially Simple, I don't remember the episode. There's over a thousand, a thousand uh, blog posts on that thing. But if you took the, the eight key areas and let's start, like, let's picture a clock in our mind. And we start at 12 o'clock down to two o'clock. Let's say that's planning and then leadership's neck from two o'clock to three o'clock, theoretically. So from 12 to three, you have planning and leadership. Okay. That's your D type personality. That's who I am. That's your dominant personality. And they're often your planners or your leaders. If you continue around the clock phase from three to six, you're going to find sales and marketing. That's your I type personalities. Those fun, loving, jovial people that just like the life of the party. That is not me. I'm like the boring guy, but they're the fun, <laughs> joving, loving, loving people. That's the I personalities. They're the sales and the marketers. When you go around from six to nine o'clock around that clock phase, now you're getting into people and operations. And those are the people who like checklists. There's a systematic, the S in the disc modeling of people. They like to have a checklist. They like to have a step one, step two, step three. They're not your long-term visionaries. In fact, now we're going to continue on the clock face. I'll come back to that. If you go from nine to 12 o'clock, that's your C. How many CPAs do we know like to count beans? That's because they're very they're very meticulous in their minds. They're very analytical. That's your C personality. What you just identified, Diane, is this. I'm a high D, like super high D personality. Directly opposite of one to three o'clock is that six to nine o'clock area, is that systems, and that's my, I'm sorry, that's my operations, my people. That's an S personality. That's my wife. That's my team members here who like, Justin, get out of our way. You're messing things up. So what happens is, as we business owners, and you may be a high S, you may be a high C, you may be high I or high D. If you look directly opposite that hourglass I just described, there is your weakest part of your business. So the very first person you hire is your soulmate for your business. You hire that person who is completing you, like you complete me on, you know, Austin Powers, I'm quoting some of my younger <laughs> days, right? You know, you complete me, me, me. You're trying to find that type of personality that's directly opposite. Here's where it gets frustrating for us business owners. They usually tick us off, those individuals, yeah. because they're like, oh, you're driving me crazy. What do you mean you want me to follow step one, step two, step three? That's not how my mind works. Don't you realize? What right. So what we have to look at as we build our team and there's our hiring process that we're developing is you're trying to create a team environment, a bitch, a human capital, remember intangible asset, human capital, so that you, the business owner, me, the business owner who stands at the epicenter of our business, who has to orchestrate this entire area and we're really good in one area and really bad in another, we can move back and we can trust that we have a balanced, harmonious team that now we can slide into our one position that we're darn good at whether it be planning. I've got some meticulous entrepreneur doctors that all they want to do is sit at the chair and do nothing else. Great. We have the team in place and they can run the business. So you've identified the personality profiles for us business owners and how it affects our human capital and our structural capital. It, it's really, it's so great um, because 
we all have to own where we are on that clock face. And and as you said, make sure that we are building a bench, whatever it looks like, for the other aspects of the business so that we're sure they are being attended to and they are being given the same kind of energy that what we are good at and we lean toward we're giving. Absolutely. Hands down. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's crazy. I'm going to take a quick sponsor break and then I, I want to continue the conversation. Sure. Accelerate Your Business Growth Podcast is happy to be sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken digital audio entertainment and information. They have over 150,000 titles to choose from, and you can listen to them on any device, including whatever you're hearing us on right now. And if you sign up at our link, which is audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth, you get one free audiobook and a one-month trial of the service. Some examples of books you can listen to on audible.com are your Oxygen Mask First by Kevin Lawrence and The Ultimate Sale by our guest, Justin Goodbride. So visit audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth, explore the books that are of interest to you, and receive one free audiobook when you sign up for the trial. As I mentioned, we are speaking with Justin Goodbread about why business value is more important than business profitability. So, Justin, let's talk a little about profitability because it's it's different from revenue. It, it it for a lot of people, they really look at that and say, "Okay, my business is profitable, therefore, it's attractive." What are they? I want to say, what are they missing? Um, how do they, maybe what I should ask is like, how do they expand their thinking beyond, is it by going over, you know, the, these, the, the four um, different capitals? It's a process that they have to go through. Um, let's define the terms a little bit and then I think we can answer the question. Okay. So uh, yep. what is value? Value is transferable a transferable asset that somebody else, an investor will look at and is willing to pay money for versus profitability is often equated to take home pay or net revenue, net operating income that's left over in the business for potential shareholders or equity players. <clears throat> Oftentimes in the business world, we, myself included, we get focused on our top line revenue. As you mentioned, not the same thing as profitability, but we get focused on that next big sale Hey, we just made a huge sale. We just had a big order, et cetera, et cetera. And then if you're kind of analytical like me, then you want to start shrinking that expense category or our COGS, cost of goods and uh, services. We start dr shrinking our COGS or our sales position so that we can see net marginal revenue or marginal revenue at the end of the day. The problem whenever I focus on profitability is it's self-focused. It's focused on me and how can I drive more revenue to me? Many times in our startup or our businesses, we want to just be profitable so that we can go out and afford some nicer things on the personal level. We may want to go and move up to a bigger house, want to buy a new car, want to put our kids in private school, whatever the, whatever the personal desire is for us business owners. But go back to that statistics that I read earlier that only 3% of the middle market actually sells. And again, the middle market's only those who are between 5 million to 100 million in revenue. That's not even dealing with a micro market, which there's 4.7 million businesses in that revenue standpoint that never produce 5 million in sales. The micro market, we, we hardly ever sell our businesses. It's very small, very small numbers of percentage because we're focused solely on profitability. We call it lifestyle business. We create a business that supports our lifestyle but we don't have a business. If we had a business, we could go away for six months and the business would actually grow while we're gone. Many quote right. business owners don't have a business, but if we can dissect and pull ourselves back or re re regress a little bit and pull ourselves back, then we realize that as we drive, as we do those things, which drive the value, <clears throat> then ultimately we can increase our profitability. But if we focus on the profitability, just net revenue, 
we actually do not increase value. And you find this when you understand the way a business is valued. So I'm gonna to attempt to oversimplify a very convoluted process on business valuation. Um, okay. and, and let's use a scenario. So oftentimes we would look at a company and we'd say, hey, their net operating income or their the marginal income or their, their profitability, whatever term you wanna use there, let's say it's $100,000. Let's say this business is cranking, they're making $100,000 that the business owner is living off of. Whenever a business appraisal is done, it ultimately boils down to, through about seven different valuation methods, boils down to this simple illustration. If I make $100,000, then there's going to be a multiplier added to my business. Maybe it's a percentage. Maybe I can sell the business for 70% of my profitability in my simple illustration. So I can sell my business for $70,000. Maybe it is I can sell my business for two times my profitability. So I can sell my business for $200,000 in that example. But what we business owners have a tendency to do is we say, you know what, if I want to sell my business for more money or if I want to increase my net worth, let me go out and work harder. Let me go out and cook more hamburgers, right? Let me focus on me that I can drive profitability. And ultimately now let's say I do grow it from $100,000 in profitability to $200,000 in profitability. But if my multiplier doesn't change and it stays at my, I think I use a number 70, or the number two, let's say it's 200,000 times two, my business value is only worth 400,000 now. But what if I changed my thinking? What if I did the Ray Kroc approach versus the McDonald's brother approach and I systematized my business and I focused on those four areas that you just alluded to? Could it be that I could keep my revenue, my profitability the same, that $100,000, and I could change my multiple from two to four? So instead of having to work harder, I've worked in my business. I created systems, so I'm decentralizing myself. And now 100,000 of revenue is worth four, a multiple of four or 400,000. So in order to understand value, how you're gonna drive your business value, it's not a profitability focused, it's a value focused. And as you focus on that multiple, however your industry does their appraisals, and there's multiple different ways, as you focus on that multiplier, what happens is, is profitability does follow. It's like a, it's like a leading indicator. It does pull, uh, as you focus on value, it does pull profitability. So it's not uncommon for me to see a business. I'm thinking of, a, of an individual I'm gonna meet with in a second. Let's use it as a case study. Let's say they're producing a million dollars of value, or I'm sorry, profitability, and they're getting 60%. So the business is worth 600,000. But let's now work in the systems and we move the 600, uh, 60% to 90%. We just had a $300,000 pickup because a million dollars at 90% is $90,000, $900,000. But because we have a better team, because we have a sales process, because we have a marketing plan, because we have a risk management plan, because we know how to hire good people, and now we have a leadership strategy in place, profitability follows, and in fact, it's not uncommon for me to be able to say, like I mentioned earlier, that I can see businesses double every three to five years by focusing on those things that Ray Kroc in my illustration earlier did. So <clears throat> the reason why we don't focus on profitability because it's self-centered. It's, it's a, it's a, it doesn't remove us business owner out of the epicenter or the center of our business. Instead, yeah. we want to constantly remove ourselves, and by building those systems in those eight key areas, we can ultimately drive the value of our company higher and make it more attractive now for that investor who's willing to pay us dollars for our business. Does that make sense, Diane? It does. It does. I appreciate it. And so it sounds to me like what the business owner has to do is stop thinking about their business as they see it and think about it through the eyes of someone who would want to purchase it. And why would they? Correct. The problem is, and candidly speaking, is that we all know the skeletons we have in our business closets. We can't yeah. look objectively at our business. And so you, one of the ways that, you know, you hire a value growth expert, or if you say you want to do it yourself, go have an appraisal on your business. Go through a benchmarking service online. Um, we have systems that we do, and you can get a value of your company, and it's going to show you 
many reasons why, where your business is. And then, you know, you know what you, the business owner is having to do, what is in your head that's not written down somewhere else. Yeah. And so now stop and start taking those things out of your head, hire somebody off of a Fiverr of an Upwork and turn that into a written format so that now you can create a process manual that teaches a 16 year old how to cook French fries without burning McDonald's down. Right. <laughs> you want to do that with every area of your business. Right. See? Right. Exactly. I do see that this is, this is really, and, and, uh, on the one, I know it can seem sort of complicated, but I really like how you've broken it down and made it doable, you know, and it really seems like it's something that, that is doable. Um, now, I, I've heard this before from people, and, and you say it as well, that business owners should plan to exit their business the moment they start their business. And would you explain why you believe that, where, where you're coming from on that thought process? Sure, no problem. So I've already started and sold three businesses for a profit, and all three are in, the, are in existence today. So I've gone through this process. I know what it's like to start a business as the American dream. You know, we, uh, we, we find something we're really good at, that we're passionate about, we turn it into a business, and we end up hating it. I, I've been there. I've also seen very, very lucrative businesses and just started because I want to make a lot of money. What I realized though is this, for the majority, the overwhelming majority of business owners, 80% of our net worth is our business. And it's a terrible asset. It's like having a stock that we have to constantly go to work for 60 to 80 hours a week that we can never cash out or sell and we get an average dividend. It's horrible. It's like having a rental house that you have to chase the tenant down on a regular, been there, done that, by the way, have to chase the yeah. tenant down on a regular basis that you can never sell the house and all you collect is rent, sometimes at above or sometimes at below market value. So the business that we have for most of us, because we are the center of the business with the overwhelming majority of business owners, we have positioned ourselves into a losing proposition. We have positioned ourselves to where 80% of our net worth is in this lousy asset that more than likely statistically we're not going to sell. And so once we realize it's not sellable, then we end up self-serving and harming those around us, whether it be the community, the customer, or the person or their team, because at some point we're going to leave our business through death, through whatever, we're going to leave our business somehow. Yeah. So the way I, the reason why I say that day one, when this comes onto your radar, stop, take a hard assessment of where you're at today in your business. Is it sellable? More than likely not. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's put it into a different, you're in Cleveland. I'm in Knoxville. If I want to drive to Cleveland or let's say I want to take a vacation with my family to Cleveland. I would probably need to know first how I'm going to get there. I could fly directly. I could drive. I could take a train. Probably I can't take a boat more than likely. I guess maybe I could. Um, <laughs> but we, you know, we could go there a number of different ways. How do I want to get there? The first very first step is I've already identified where I want to be. For most business owners, we don't even do that. We're just living life, yeah. you know, like riding a raging bull. But if I realize where I want to be, then I can now can start backwards engineering. How am I going to get there? Am I going to take a car? Are we going to stop and see sites along the way? Am I just going to drive straight through? I think six, seven hours up to Cleveland. Am I going to drive straight through? Where am I going to stay? Et cetera, et cetera. What are we going to eat? All those fun things. What are we going to do when we get there? If I equate that to the business world and we just pause, because most of us like chasing revenue, we just pause. Where are we really doing with our business? Statistically, it won't sell. But can we actually achieve the impossible? Can we actually achieve, which is why I wrote the book, The Ultimate Sale, to where we grow our business to where one day you and those team players that helped you get to where you, the business owner, the business providers are headed, can you and your team actually have this take this job and shove it type moment where you get this big, nice, fat paycheck and right off into the sunset to do like I did and start another business or perhaps retire? If you never start looking at where you're headed, then how do you know where you're going? It's kind of like that. What is it? The Alice in Wonderland quote with a little rabbit. Hey, where are you going? Well, it doesn't really matter. You're going to go anywhere. You're going to get there. So that's the reason why most of us say that. 
that's interesting. Okay. So, okay. And and that sounds to me like it's actually, I mean, I, I really like that because when I'm listening to that, I'm thinking so many people start a business because they have a skill set in something and they just go, 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 but they never stop and think, what do I want this thing to look like? And so they don't know whether they're getting there or not, and then they don't have any sort of plans, which is number one uh, on your eight key areas of yeah. planning. Yeah, they're not doing it because they're just getting up every day and working a job. Well, and even if they're good at planning, I'm going to throw something that many people don't think about. Um, Michael Phelps. I use him a lot. I've never met him. I met some other famous Olympic swimmers, but Michael Phelps, I liked watching him win the gold and the medals he won in the Olympics not too long ago. It was amazing to me to see him, an individual, win that many medals. It just was profound to me. Yeah. Michael Phelps is amazing to me because not only is he one of the greatest swimmers of all time, he has a coach. He actually has multiple yeah. coaches. His coaches can't swim as good as he could. His coaches yeah. did some swimming, but they weren't very good swimmers. But yet he had a coach. Michael Jordan, arguably one of the greatest basketball players of all time, had a coach. Let's flip it over to the business world. Steve Jobs, Elon Musk have coaches. The reason why we often never reach our goals or our full potential is because, let's be candid here, we business owners are often tightwads because we're watching the bottom line and trying to drive revenue. We don't see the value in having someone come alongside of us and say, hey, Michael, your stroke is off, buddy. Your hand's in the wrong spot. Hey, that kick turn, yeah, you can't dolphin kick like that. You're going to get penalized. You got to have a coach who's looking at that business objectively. I do. I have people in my life that come into my businesses, my three businesses, and say, hey, Justin, time out. I got a board of advisors that I pay to come in and look at our business and say, hey, buddy, you got a problem here. So the, what is going to drive us to that point is not the fact that we're, we're good in one area or lousy. No, that's humans. That's all. We're all flawed, right? We all have our problems. It's having somebody or a team of people that can look at your business, your life, your finances and say, hey, you need to take step one, step two, step three, and nothing more. Yeah, I see the little shiny object out there. Stop looking at it, almost like blinders on a horse. Stop looking at it. Let's come back and make the main thing the main thing. So it, it, it ends up being that we get so busy and we get so cost conscious. That's the old saying that we're penny wise, pound foolish yeah. in our business. And we don't have that coach, consultant, et cetera, who can look at our businesses. And let's be candid. I've also been on the other side of that where many coaches and consultants aren't worth the time of day. They don't know what they're right. talking about. So I understand it, but that's, that's what I see as the key problem for us as business owners is we need to have somebody who can hold us accountable to our dreams that can do so that actually knows what the heck they're talking about. Well, I agree with that. I agree with everything that you said. I, I, it, is, it is a tricky thing because, um, yes, I, I think most business owners, I, interestingly, I think most people don't think about what I'll call self-care. They don't think about spending money on themselves anywhere in the mix because they're so busy thinking about that they want to make sure everything else is covered and everyone else is covered and everything else is done. And they don't realize that if they're not doing that, then they're not helping make sure that everyone else is taken care of and everything else is done. And then you add into it that there are some people who aren't very good. And so, you know, you have one bad experience and you're not going to try it again because it's a trust thing. So it's tricky. It is tricky. It's still the airplane analogy. I was, I'm, I'm going to fly again here next weekend. And every time I get on the airplane, no matter which fly, carrier I use, they always tell me if I'm riding with a baby or a child to put my mask on myself first before I put on the child or the baby. Right. And to your point, we business owners often, what's the old saying? The cobbler's kids shoes are never shod that we yep. focus on everybody else except for ourselves. Uh, so uh, you can drive value in your company is the key. You can. And there's books upon books upon books written on how to do it. 
fact that we're looking at our second book coming out, it's going to be dealing with that exact subject. But at the end of the day, we can have all the knowledge. What does it say? Education with, without application leads to stagnation. Unless we get, unless we take the knowledge that we have and we have somebody who's going to hold us accountable, unless we have that right. fit coach that we have that make us do one more push up or one more pull up or one more lap around the track, then we're never going to reach the potential that we truly can. Yeah. And therefore we're never right. going to reach the value or have a sellable business that we all can do. We all given the same amount of hours in the day, same various abilities, but we all can achieve this ultimate sale. We can. Right. Right. This is really great. I, I so appreciate it. Will you uh, let the listeners know, you know, how they can find you? Um, I, you know, I mentioned the one book is on Audible, but, you know, whatever you've got going on um, with your next book and, you know, so they know how to stay connected. Sure, sure. So I was, I would point everybody directly to Financially Simple. That's the hub. It's a, it's the blog. It has all the podcasts. We have the Financially Simple podcast with over 210 episodes already dealing with multiple different areas. Right now we're covering personal finances for business owners from a business owner perspective. It's, it's a fun little journey. Nice. We, um, we have a couple of courses. We have a new course coming out. I'm hoping to have it out by the end of this month on creating a strategic plan. Actually, how do you do planning in your business? And this is the same process that our team of, of MBAs and our professionals here within our organizations, they walk our clients through clients that are just getting started to clients that have businesses valued at multiple eight figures. I mean, at eight figures and higher. So it's the standardized process that you can systematize, use this and use it in your business. Um, you find us on YouTube, any of those social media, just Google Financially Simple or Justin Gibbard. We're easy to connect with. That's awesome. Thank you. And, and as I said, thanks for spending some time with me and sharing this information. It, it's tremendously valuable and understandable. So thanks. It's a bonus. Great. Thank you so much for having uh, me, Diane. Oh, absolutely. And I, I always like to thank the listeners. You guys are who we're doing this for, as well as our sponsor. Uh, to get a free trial of audible.com as well as a free audiobook, just go to audibletrial.com slash business growth to sign up. As always, continue to prosper and be curious. And until we meet again on another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, goodbye and good day. Me, 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 but also you. <laughs> the Pharaoh fast forwards his favorite foreign film, Powder Donut. <clears throat> Okay, what's my line? Uh, the only line I see here on the script is get options based on your budget with the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. Oh man, that's a tongue twister, huh? I'm sorry, I'm gonna need a few more minutes. <clears throat> bulbous Walrus, the Bulbous Walrus. The Name Your Price tool, only from Progressive. The owl ran afoul of the comatose Coxswain. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates price and coverage match limited by state law. Are you tired of seeing your teen or young adult struggle on a path that clearly isn't the right fit? Is your teenager confused about which direction to take after high school? The future of work is changing rapidly, and our kids need to know all of the options available after high school so they're empowered to make the choice that is best for them. In each episode, we explore the latest trends that are shaping the opportunities of today and tomorrow. I'm your host, Betsy Jewell, and this is the High School Hamster Wheel Podcast.